Okay, we're going to do an expository study of the book of Philemon. Now this week we're going to cover chapter 1. I don't think I'm going to be able to get to chapter 2 or 3. So, uh, go to Philemon 1. If you're newly saved, you probably don't understand the joke I just pulled there. There is only one chapter in the book of Philemon, so we'll never be getting to chapter 2 or 3. Unless maybe, you know, there's some new version out there. Maybe they have a chapter 2 or 3. I don't know about yet. But uh, Philemon 1, verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. Wait a second. Paul, a prisoner of Caesar? No. Paul, a prisoner of the Roman government? No. What's it say there? It says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Who put Paul in prison? You say the Roman Empire. Okay. Who controls the Roman Empire? Jesus Christ. Let me show you what I mean. Turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. One of the key scriptures in your New Testament for a Christian. I think probably the verse that I've seen to be more true and proved it time and time and time again with my life. I'll tell you what, if you don't know this verse, this is one you need to memorize right here. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. If all things work together for good, does that mean that your life is being directed? Oh, yeah. But the key there is, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Well, excuse me. To them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. If you're doing the will of the Lord, and the Lord is directing your life, and you're submitting yourself to the book, everything that happens to you in your life is going to work together for good. doesn't mean that all the events are going to be good. It means that they all work together for good. You know, there's a lot of bad things that have happened to me in my life that brought me to this point right here. And at the time, you know, I had a couple bad relationships and I thought to myself, I guess I'm never going to get married. 36 years old before I got married for the first time. I'm sure glad the Lord did not grant me my requests back in the past though. See, the bad things that happened ended up working together for good. And you talk about a good or a really wild example of that you get Paul in prison, it worked together for good. I mean, if Paul had never gone to prison, there would never be any prison epistles. Right? There would never be any letters from Paul to other Christians out there that he wrote in prison. And I think it would probably have not led to the same amount of character that Paul had. I mean, I'm sure I'm glad that there was this man there that we can read about his life. He's such an inspiration for us Christians. Just going out there and just preaching the gospel no matter what it cost. Being beaten. I was thinking about that this week. and You know, he's talked about thrice was I beaten with rods. And I thought, what on earth would that be like? You know, I was outside working and it's fairly cold here. And, and I went to take this bungee strap thing off and it has a little plastic ball on the end and a, then a bungee loop. And I was going to take that thing off as, you know, about five degrees outside Fahrenheit, you know. And I went to take it off and that thing slipped and just came down and smacked me, that little plastic ball, wham, right on my knuckle. Boy, that stung, you know, and I thought, ouch. And I got to thinking, what would it be like to be beaten with rods? Not just a little bang on the knuckle on your back. Rods? Did that work together for good? Yeah, it did. And you can get to a point where you realize, hey, everything that's happening in my life is working together for good, so therefore, whatever happens to me is a result of Jesus Christ directing my life. That's why Paul can write, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Why? If Jesus Christ didn't want him in the prison, he could get out like that. And Jesus Christ did break him out of prison quite a few times. But Paul said, I'm in this bad situation. I don't really understand why, but I'll know, I know one thing, and that is Jesus Christ has me here for a reason. 
and you might be going through some kind of a bad thing in your life right now and you don't know why, just as I didn't know why, I don't even, I lost count, you know, things that have happened in my past, and you say, why is this happening? Because of Jesus Christ. The Lord has you there for some kind of a reason. He's building character into your life. I remember years ago, I was called to jury duty. I was scared to death. I didn't want to go to jury duty. I mean, I'm thinking, oh boy, it's unconstitutional, first of all. It's not a real true jury of your peers and all these other issues. But, you know, I thought to myself, I thought, but what if there is some Christian who has been wrongly accused and I'm going to get to be on the jury to overthrow the unconstitutional ruling? What if there's somebody there that I get to witness to? What if there's, you know what? The Lord has me going to this thing for a reason. So I went. I went with my King James Bible. You know, they never did call me for the jury duty. They probably saw it and were like, uh, you know, don't call that guy. I don't know. But the point is, brethren, no matter what situation you're in, if you are, if you love the Lord and you're called according to his purpose, you are fulfilling the will of God in your life, no matter what you're going through, I can assure you, Jesus Christ has you going through it for a reason. And you need to look for that reason. Let's go back to Philemon. We're going to read verse 2. Philemon, verse 2. And to our beloved Apphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house... Hmm. It does not say the church that is thy household. Okay. I actually read a commentary. The guy said that, you know, that just means the church that is the house, their household church. In other words, the people that are there in the house. It doesn't say that. It says the church that is in thy house. What does that mean? That means in their living room, they had this big white building with stained glass windows and a huge big Greek Parthenon, you know, and, and a big steeple on the top. Right in the living room. Isn't that amazing? No, I'm being a little sarcastic here. What it means is the church is the group of people. They were meeting in Philemon's house. The church in thy house. See? And by the way, another argument which I've heard from some of the people that defend church buildings, they say, well, you see, back in the first century when the Bible was written... You know, they just didn't have the money or the means to, to build the church buildings yet. So, you know, they met in houses. Yeah, they met in houses back there in the, in the New Testament. But later on, when they had more money and more, they were established a little bit better, then they built the church buildings. Um, okay, uh, could you please show me some instruction that, you know, now we have to meet in houses, but eventually meet in the church buildings? You say, no, no, Brian, because it happened after the first century, after the Bible was completed. Okay, then why is it that I can go back to the first century and I can show you buildings that are used by pagans that resemble the modern day church buildings? Why is that? If these church buildings weren't available back then, then why do the, the modern day church buildings look like the pagan temples in the first century? You can listen to the uh, Independent Fundamental Baptist Catholicism studies if you want more information on that, on the history of the church building. But you see there this thing of their meeting in the house. And it's so important to understand this. Not because you're forced to meet in a house. You have to meet in a house because it says they met in houses. So you can't meet in the fields or you can't meet in the woods or you can't meet in a barn someplace. No, no, that's not what I'm trying to say. The importance here is understanding that church is a reference to people. Every single time it shows up, there's not one reference in the entire New Testament to church being a building. It's always the people. The people. Understand that. And when you build this pagan temple and call it a church, you have people in the church that are not in the church. So what are you talking about? I'm talking about people that are in this building that you are calling a church, but they're not actually in the body of Christ, the true church. And that's just so tragic because so many people count on their church membership as their means of salvation. Pardon me, sir, are you saved? Well, I go to church. 
even though that term go to church does not appear in the King James Bible. It's important to understand that. I know I harp on this thing a lot, brethren, but this system has become so entrenched in our society that now we don't even think about it anymore. You say, where's the uh, nearest church? People will always they'll point to a building. That's not it. That's not it. But we'll continue. Philemon verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting because Paul begins and ends all of his epistles with grace. Interesting there. And it is God's grace, by the way, that will give you peace. God's grace is unmerited. It's something that you don't earn. He looks down upon you and he says, you don't really deserve this, but I'm going to give it to you anyhow. You know, none of us are really worth saving if you want to get right down to it. It's God's grace that saves us. It's God's grace that keeps us fed, that keeps clothes on our backs. Okay? And it's knowing that God has grace for us, that God does, doesn't say, you know, oh, you sinned today, drop dead. No, God has grace for us. Okay? He gives us liberty, not to sin, but liberty to, if we do sin, He forgives us. He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, if we confess our sins, by the way. That's what the verse says there. But the point is, God's grace, knowing that we have a God that cares about us, that will provide for us, that grace will bring you peace. So you see there, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Verse 4. I thank my God making mention of the always in my prayers. Question. How often do you pray for the brethren? And thank God for what he has done in your life. How often do you pray for your brothers and sisters in the Lord? Let me show you how often you should. Keep your hand there in, in Philemon because we'll be coming back there. Uh, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians 5 verses 17 and 18. Okay, it says here, pray without ceasing and everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Pray without ceasing. You say, what if something bad happens to me? Romans 8, 28. Thank the Lord for it. You say, thank the, wait a second. If something bad happens, I'm going to thank God for it. As a verse 18 says, in everything give thanks. Everything. You know, and I've said this before in other studies, but I'll repeat it again because it's very true and we have to keep it in our minds at all times. If you get a flat tire, you better thank God for it. Why? Well, you could have, uh, if you were on time, you might have been going through an intersection and somebody runs through that red light and broadsides you and kills you. The Lord knows that. The Lord can see out ahead and He can say, okay, I don't want you dying quite yet. You still have some work to do, so flat tire. Oh, your car broke down. This happens, that happens, whatever happens. All these things. Give thanks. Pray without ceasing. That's what you're supposed to do. Go back to Philemon. Let's go to the next verse. Philemon verse 5. Okay. Hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. So you see there, your prayer is to be based on love. Making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. He's commending Philemon. Why? Because he has love for the Lord Jesus. But notice the second one. You know, see the first one's easy, but notice the second one there. And toward all saints. Ugh. I can be rough at times. Why? Well, it's easy to love somebody who's perfect and never makes mistakes. But then you have to go and love the brethren who aren't perfect and who make plenty of mistakes. That's the hard one. Okay? Let's go to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. 
beginning in verse 7. Okay, it says here, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. Okay, notice he said there, love one another. He's talking about saved people. He's not talking about lost people. So you get saved people come along saying, you should love each other, you know, love everybody. Well, well, just hold on there. This love that's being talked about in these verses is talking about brotherly love, love among the brethren, love among the saved. All right. This is not talking about you loving Christ-rejecting sinners. Now, you should love them in the sense of witnessing to them. You should love them enough to tell them the truth. But loving them in their sin and going along with what they're doing and their wickedness and their blasphemy and whatever else, that's not really loving them. Why? You're not warning them that they're going to hell. You're not offending them. And so they continue on in their sin and they die and they go to hell. That's not love. All right? These verses here, don't, don't ever let anybody convince you that this is talking about how we should love everybody. That's not what's going on here. All right? Do not be deceived by that. And don't be deceived by this teaching either. You can listen to my sermon, Does God Love Lost Sinners? A lot of, another thing that these people do, they'll try to say that God loves the lost. You know, he, he loves the, the, what is it, uh, hates the sin but loves the sinner. That's not even in the Bible. Listen to that sermon. I, I can't get into all that right now, but I cover all the passages that are used by people to say that God loves lost people. He does not. God loved the past tense, but he does not love present, present tense, Christ rejecting sinners. The Bible does not teach that. Listen to the sermon. Verse 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us, and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. See it there? No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and His love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For who, he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God, whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God, love his brother also. Okay? So, that there is very important to keep in mind. You do need to love the brethren. All right. Now, I'll tell you right now, of the lines of who's really saved and who's not really saved, false convert kind of thing, those lines are very blurry right now. All right. There's a lot of people that I'm, you know, I first hear about them and I'm like, yeah, I think that they're saved. And then you see more and more and more and it's like, I don't know. Some people out there, do a real good job of convincing me that they're not saved, <laughs> okay? And I usually prefer to, to, to err on the side of caution. I don't like telling lost people that they're saved when they're not, all right? If I question somebody's salvation and they're actually saved but just very carnal, well, okay. But I judge a man based on, is there, has there been a conversion there? Has there been a repentant state before conversion? Are they a new creature in Christ Jesus? Okay, that's how judge, I judge somebody. How do they line up with the truth? All right, is there, a, is there an animosity towards the truth and absolute facts and things? If there is, eh, you're dealing with a lost person. You know, nine times out of ten, you're dealing with somebody who's lost, especially if they've been, quote-unquote, saved for a long time. If they're newly saved, well, there again, I'll give them a little bit of leeway. But the point is, there are brethren out there 
that have been saved for a long time, yes, they do believe the truth, yes, they have been converted, whatever else, but you can have disagreements with them, and sometimes it can get kind of a little bit, you know, vicious, and you start to kind of lose some of that love for them. You can't do that, okay? We have to love the brethren. We're, we're called to love the brethren, right? And sometimes, you know, there again, we're going to see about this as we can continue. And actually, if you want to turn there a while, Galatians chapter 4, we'll go there. You know, loving the brethren does not mean that you have to be some kind of a soft little effeminate, you know, milk toast that just, you know, is never sarcastic or anything like that. That's not loving the brethren. Okay, there are some times that you're going to be a little bit sarcastic in things. Let's look here in Galatians chapter 4, verse 12 through 16. It says here, Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. And my temptation which was in my flesh ye despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness ye spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and had have given them to me. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Boy, I can relate. Um, there have been a lot of people that uh, put me up on too high of a pedestal and they think I'm just the next best thing to, you know, the whatever the wheel, you know, and, and all of a sudden I disappoint them and now I'm a heretic. And it's just like I've become their enemy because I tell them the truth a lot of times. And because sometimes I say something that's controversial and people don't like it. And so they just, you know, I'm good, godly, you know, Brian Denlinger and the next thing, blam, I'm down because I told them the truth. You know, uh, you're supposed to love the brethren. And if I'm telling you the truth, if I give you scripture and you can't refute the thing, well, then you need to change. You need to change your attitude, not to me, but to the book. All right? That's important to get. Let's go back to Philemon. If you have a ribbon marker, now would be a good time, I guess, to mark the page so you don't have to keep your hand there. But uh, Philemon, verse 6, That the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Okay? Now, this is also a very important thing. All right? You are supposed to judge yourself and keep yourself judged so you stay in fellowship with God. And I'm going to actually show you that here. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. While we're turning there, I can... I'll keep saying what I want to say here. And the fact is, yes, you should judge yourself there and you should keep yourself judged up so that you're not falling into condemnation. Let me show you here. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31 and 32 says, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Okay? So you have a book, you have a standard, and you use this book, to judge your life. That's very important. So you should be very self-judging. Go back to Philemon. You should be very self-judging. Okay? But there are times, like it says here in the verse, you know, uh, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you, in Christ Jesus. You know, if you're watching these videos, I can tell you, you have already found out some good things about the Lord. All right? You're here because you are a King James Bible believer. All right? You're here because you know that I stand for creation science. I don't believe in evolution of any kind. Um, I believe the King James Bible is God's perfect word. I believe the Catholic Church is Mystery Babylon and therefore satanic and corrupt and the versions that they produce. You know, I am against you know, CCM, all forms of it, contemporary Christian music. I'm against all forms of that. I stand for the old time faith. I stand for the biblical way. See, now if you've stood for all those same things, if God has brought you to that point where these things have been shown to you, then I can tell you those are good things. See, judgment is not always just negative. 
All right? A judge will say, guilty, innocent. And so sometimes it's good just to remind yourself, okay, yes, I have these things that I need to fix up in my life, but you know what? At least I'm a Bible believer. At least I believe in creation science. The Lord's shown me the proof of that. At least I don't listen to the rock music anymore. At least I gave up watching television and movies. At least I, you see? Sometimes it's good to judge your life and to actually say, okay, I've done a few things right. Okay? Positive judgment, in other words. Let me show you some interesting things here about that. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. You can keep your hand there in Philemon unless you have your bookmark in it. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. It says here, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Remember that word. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministry ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. So these uh, Macedonian Christians, Paul was uh, judging them, wasn't he? Yeah. But what was his judgment? Negative or positive? Positive. It was good judgment. He was saying, you know, I mean, think about the Apostle Paul writing, you know, uh, here, where is it? Uh, verse 3. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they are willing of themselves. Wow. You talk about a, a, a commendation there, you know, a, a great thing, a, a, somebody really writing something great about you. And I'll tell you right now, some of you have some real spiritual power and some real spiritual gifts. I've seen some of the comments, you know, I, I mean, I can't reply to all your comments, but I will occasionally scan through the comments. And it's just like some of you, you know, you come up with some really profound things. You know, it's a real blessing to read some of the comments. And, and, you know, I'm not talking at all the comments that are, you know, positive. Sometimes I get some, some real challenges from some of the brethren. They disagree with me or whatever else. I appreciate some of the comments. Okay? To your power, spiritually, I can bear record. A lot of you have really gone through a lot in life, and you really have some great things to add to the discussion. You know, I praise the Lord for that. You know, I love to have challenges from the brethren. And it's kind of funny because I was told, you know, the one time that because I'm not in fellowship, you know, regular physical fellowship with other Christians that, you know, I don't meet on a regular occasion with a huge group of 300, you know, people, you know, then I, I'm, I'm kind of missing out on, on the fellowship. I have never once been to a Babel building where I've had tremendous fellowship with everybody there, Okay. Um, it's usually a very, very small minority of people. Most of the other people think you're nuts for talking about the Bible before and after service, you know. And, you know, I don't miss that at all, okay? I know some people do. Some people wish that they could have a Bible building in their area that they could go be part of and have the fellowship and all that. I could care less about it. I have more challenging comments and statements and people writing to me and saying things to me and whatever else right here on YouTube, uh, through the website, you know, letters in the mail and things like that. I've been getting some really neat letters in the mail. Thank you to those who have sent them. Some really good sermon ideas. I mean, just phenomenal. People sending me these articles and things. It's just like, wow, you know, really incredible information. So, but again, I just wanted to say, if you're here on this channel, Pat yourself on the back at least for a few things. Not because you, you know, agree with Brian Denlinger and I'm the great guy or something. No, 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 no. It's just if we have fellowship in terms of the Bible that we use and the music that we listen to and other standards and things, praise Lord that you've stood for those things and stay with it, by the way. Don't be discouraged and think, well, maybe I should drop the King James Bible. Stay with it, all right? Stay with listening to the right kind of music. Stay with eating the right kind of foods. That is important. 
all right, stay with all the things, the aspects of truth that line up with this King James Bible. Stick with it. Let's go to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4, verse 15. Again, we're going to see some positive judgment here. Paul judging Christians positively. Philippians 4, verse 15 through 19. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from where? Macedonia? We just read about over there in 2 Corinthians? Huh. When I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So, again, these people were giving. They were very giving people. They were charitable. All right. That doesn't mean that they're giving to charitable causes. Okay. We always associate money with that thing. These people were giving their time. They were giving effort. They were supplying for Paul as well monetarily. But the point is, these people were very fervent about the things of the Lord. They had charity. It's very important to have that. Go next to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2. Okay, it says here, We give thanks to God always, always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. Remember what he said about the, the believers in Macedonia? Their deep poverty and their joy. Do you have joy in deep poverty? How about uh, in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost? Do you have joy in much affliction? When your family and your friends and your co-workers and everybody else is attacking you, do you have joy? Difficult, isn't it? Look at verse 7. So that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia, there it is again, and Achaia, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. They don't even need to commend them. These believers in Thessalonica were doing such a great job, it was just like, hey, their testimony speaks for themselves. Verse 9, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Unless you believe in a post trib rapture, then you believe you're going through the wrath. <laughs> Had to throw that in there. But you see, a great Christian will have joy and charity. Those are two things there. If you have joy, no matter what you go through, that's something that's great. And you can judge yourself in that and say, hey, I'm doing that right. And if you have charity, you can also say, I'm doing that right. So, if you're doing those things, keep up the great work. Go back to Philemon, verse 7. And if you don't have those things, then get to work. Um, Philemon, verse 7. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Okay? And, you know, let me say this. The testimony of a... Christian that's in fellowship with the Lord, a Christian that's doing something for the Lord there. You know, we have great joy and consolation in thy love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. A Christian who's living right with God 
it's, it's a great encouragement to the rest of us. But a miserable Christian that's complaining and all oh, this is wrong, uh, you know, because you've messed around with sin your whole life and now you're, you know, basically uh, uh, reaping <laughs> what you've sown in your whole life. Um, that's the kind of thing that, that uh, depresses other Christians, you know. It's not an exhortation. I'm not talking about, hey, if you really have some things wrong and you're really trying to have somebody help you and things like that. Yeah, you know, you have to talk about some of the things that have been bad. But if you just never have any victory, you never have any joy, you never have any charity, it's a problem. But what about this thing there? It says about, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. What does this word bowels mean? Well, Webster's 1828 Dictionary defines it as, Number one, the intestines of an animal, the entrails, especially of man, the heart. Hmm. Number two, the interior part of anything as the bowels of the earth. Number three, the seat of pity or kindness, hence tenderness, compassion, a scriptural sense. Okay? So in other words, bowel, when we think of it in our modern context, we think of the intestines. So think of the bowels. Okay? But in the biblical sense, and in the way it used to be used, the, when English was still high English, you know, before we dumbed it down and dumbed it down through the satanic agenda of Hollywood, you know, the fact is the word bow back in proper English, which is what we had in the past, simply meant your insides, basically like your heart. It could mean your heart. So you'd say, you know, uh, boy, I just... My heart goes out to them. It'd be the modern way of saying, like, my bowels, you know, go out to them. That's what's being used here. It's, again, you know, we've had so many of the King James Bible words that have been twisted and, and changed to make the King James Bible look bad. It's part of the satanic agenda here in these last days. Why? Because the Bible says we're to hold fast the form of sound words. All right? We're to stick to the biblical vocabulary, the biblical dictionary, if you will. Because the Bible does define a lot of its words within context and whatever else, you know. And people haven't. So now you have words in the King James Bible that they say, well, it's passed out of common use. Yeah, because of the satanic conspiracy. Okay, it doesn't mean we shouldn't use them or we should update the King James Bible. So, bowels is the correct word there. All right. Um, next, go to verse 8 and 9. Let's read these. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such in one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Okay, what does the word enjoin mean? Enjoin means, quote, to order or direct with urgency, to admonish or instruct with authority, to command. So he says, therefore, uh, wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to command you, basically is what he's saying, to enjoin thee that which is convenient. Yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee. In other words, he's saying, I should, you know, I can command you. All right? I mean, think of who's writing this. One of the apostles. You know, one of God's chosen apostles. And he's saying, hey, I can command you, but I'm not going to. I want to ask you. I'm going to beseech you. There being such, as, such in one as Paul the aged and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. There he says prisoner of Jesus Christ again. Okay? So what's he asking him? Verse 10. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Wow, Paul was married and he had a son named Onesimus. No, that's not what's going on there. What he's saying is, when you lead somebody to Christ, you in a sense are spiritually like a father. To them, okay. It doesn't mean that they call you father, all right. Don't let the Catholic thing work in there. No, it just simply means now they're like a son, all right. And you see that if you saw the other studies on First Timothy, First and Second Timothy, and Titus, Paul is calling Timothy and Titus his son. Why? He led those men to the Lord, and then he instructed them. He taught them, and that's what a father should do. By the way. It's the father that should teach the son. Right? If you lead somebody to the Lord, you should be there to disciple them. And to say, hey, you know, let me show you. And you say, well, Brian, do you do that with everybody that you've ever led to the Lord? Oh, no, because I can't. I'm not physically there. That's what this channel's about. 
if you've been led to the Lord by the, you know, if I should say that if the Lord has led you to this channel and you got saved because you saw the salvation message or whatever else, I try to provide as much instruction in Scripture as I can. All free of charge. Nothing is copyrighted here. You know, I encourage brethren to take my videos and put them onto their own channels, re-upload them, you know, get the software to take the video and, you know, put it on your own channel and spread it. That's what I'm doing. Why? Because I want to see young Christians being trained up in the right ways of the Lord. Just as simple as that. But uh, notice a couple things here. You know, um... He says there, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Where then would have Onesimus been? Outside or inside the prison? Well, probably inside the prison. You're going to see why here as we continue. So Onesimus is a fellow prisoner. right? Paul leads him to the Lord. And I know a lot of brethren out there, they get into the thing of prison ministry, and that's, that's a great thing. You know? If you can get in there and you don't have to do a whole lot of paperwork, I know that there's some issues there now, but uh, prison ministry is a great place to go and witness to lost men because there aren't going to be many lost men that say, I'm not a sinner when they're sitting behind bars. Right? So there's some really good opportunities for witnessing there. But uh, we'll continue here. Verse 11, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. Almost sounds like uh, Onesimus had a changed life there. You know, Second Corinthians chapter five verse seventeen: If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You think? You know, and people say, "Well, that's lordship salvation." No, that's biblical salvation. All right, and I've talked about that thing quite a bit, so I'm not going to go over it again. But the point is. There's a change that happens when you get saved. These people that say, I got saved and nothing happened. Nothing changed. Well, then you didn't get saved. <laughs> it's as simple as that. You know, if you don't clean up your life, if, if the Lord doesn't come in and start, you know, cleaning out that sin, oh, you didn't get saved. See, Onesimus here, we're going to see this as we continue, he ran away from his master Philemon. And Paul, he got caught, he's put in prison, you know, I don't know what Onesimus was doing to go to jail, I don't think it was just running away from Philemon, he was probably doing some other bad things, he's in jail, Paul's in jail, jail, you know, maybe the next cell or whatever else, or I don't even know how it worked back then, but he witnesses to, to Onesimus, leads him to the Lord, instructs him in the way of the Lord, and now Onesimus is being released from jail, and Paul is saying, go back to Philemon. But what he's asking here is he's saying, hey, if you don't need him, I'd like to have him serve me. Let's continue here. I don't want to get ahead of myself. All right. Uh, well, we'll I'll, I'll go back to that there in a minute. Uh, verse 12. Whom I have sent again, thou therefore for receive him, that is mine own bowels. In other words, this guy's really dear to Paul. He's like this, my heart is really, this guy's really special to me. Okay? But notice he says he sends him again. He didn't say, hey, now you're saved, you know, you, you don't have to be a slave. You don't have to be this Philemon's bondservant. That's wrong. Slavery is an unjust evil. No, he says, go back to Philemon. You ran away from him? Go back. All right? Let's go to Ephesians 4.28. Ephesians 4.28 says, Let him that steal, stole, I'll get it yet. Let him that stole, steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the things, the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. All right? So a change happens at salvation. Now go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter six verses one and two 
says here, let as many servants as are under the yoke, under the yoke, you know, count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them, because they are brethren, but rather do them service, because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. Does the King James Bible support slavery? Yes, actually it does. The King James Bible does not teach against slavery. That is a modern invention of humanistic philosophers. All right. Does the King James Bible lay out rules for having bond servants? Oh yeah, absolutely. You're not supposed to treat them like animals. You're not supposed to be mean to bond servants. Okay, there are whole laws back in the Old Testament about that. All right, and I have a again, I have a sermon on that. I've preached on this issue before. Does the Bible teach does the King James Bible teach slavery? You can watch that video if you've not heard that. You know, just this this whole modern politically correct system attacks the Bible and we want to make excuses and say, oh, oh no, it doesn't teach slavery. Yes, it does. Yes, it absolutely does. Onesimus was a bond servant. He gets out of jail and Paul says, go back to your master. It's right there. He said, I don't like that. Well, then you don't like the Bible. Your problem is with the Word of God, not you know, what I'm saying. Philemon verse 13 It says here, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. Okay, so in other words, he's saying, Philemon, you can't be here, but your bond servant, you know, in thy stead, he can be here and help me. Okay, look at verse 14. But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. All right. He's saying, without thy mind would I do nothing. Well, didn't Onesimus have any say in the matter? I mean, didn't wasn't Onesimus a free man? Couldn't he make up his own mind who he wanted to go with? No. No. Paul said, hey, Onesimus, you are the property of Philemon. Go back to your master. And you tell him that I'd like to have you come and work for me. I'd like to have you as my servant. It's really something, isn't it? He could have said, don't go back to Philemon. You're a free man now. You just stay here and you help out me. He didn't do that. Go back to your master and ask permission from him if you can come back to me. And if not, well, then you stay there. And you serve him. Hmm. A very contrary to our modern uh, politically correct system. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5. Notice it said there in uh, Philemon verse uh, 14, what we just read, it said, But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. Read here in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2 through 4. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Your service to the Lord should be willing service. That's where charity comes in, self-sacrificial love. It should be willing, not of necessity. You shouldn't be there and saying, oh man, I have to do this thing. Uh, you know, it should be willingly. And Paul, back there in Philemon, you can uh, go back there again. Philemon. Paul, back here in the book of Philemon, he is saying that, you know, without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity. In other words, I... You know, Paul is saying, I could put a guilt trip on you, I could command you, I could tell you that I'm taking Onesimus, but I want it to be your decision. That's why I'm beseeching you, and it's not of necessity, but if you willing, are willing you know, to do this thing, then send him back, and I'll be thankful for it. Why? Because Onesimus was the property of Philemon. Oh, that's so politically incorrect. Yes, it is. 
That's why it's the Word of God. And political correctness is a trap of Satan. Why? Yea, hath God said. The old satanic trap that's lasted for 6,000 years. He just keeps on using the same thing. Okay, let's look at verse 15 through 17 here in Philemon. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever. Look at verse 16. Remember what it said there in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Okay, that the servant and the master are brethren. Verse 16. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and and in the Lord, see, he's saying, yeah, he ran away from you, but now that he's coming back, he's your brother in Christ. Okay, he is above a servant. He's more than just property, all right? He is now above a servant. You say, well, then great, then when he gets back to Philemon, then he can boss Philemon around and he doesn't have to work to, for Philemon. No, it doesn't work that way. Verse 17, if thou count me therefore as a partner, receive him as myself. In other words, in terms of spiritual um, respect and things like that, he's saying, you treat Philemon, you treat your bond servant, your slave, you treat him just like you treat me. He's a brother. But in terms of physical... He's being sent back to you as your slave, as your worker. Get out there and get that work done. But uh, by the way, after the work's over, we're going to have a Bible study and you're free to come on into it. See, that's the proper relationship there. He's my brother in Christ, but he's still my servant. Hmm. You say, well, I'm i got to be honest, Brian, I'm very offended by this. I'm offended by the thing of you teaching slavery. I'm offended by you saying that it's sanctioned by Scripture. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians chapter 6. Again, I've been over these verses many times, but we'll hit them one more time because we're doing an expository study and most of these verses that relate to Philemon are going to be found in the Pauline epistles. There are some things back in the Old Testament too, of course, but this one really applies well. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. Excuse me. It says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Verse 20, For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You say, I'm offended by the idea of slavery. Well, that's a problem because you are a slave. You are a bond servant. It's not, I made the decision to be saved and therefore I'm a Christian. No, uh, it's God's decision whether or not you get saved. He is the one that buys you with the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's why a lot of people come to the Lord for salvation, but they are coming in their pride and in their self-righteousness. They're not about to do what the Lord tells them to do with their lives. Okay? They don't care. They're not a bondservant of Jesus Christ. So, God hasn't purchased them. God is not required to accept people simply because they come to Him and say, Save me. Alright, I preached a sermon years and years ago. You chose Jesus, but did Jesus choose you? I think a lot of people, they might have chosen Jesus, but Jesus certainly did not choose them. Why? Because they're coming in their self-righteousness. They're not broken. They're coming and they're saying, you know, I'm going to pray a prayer. I mean, think about it. You get some atheist and, he, and he, he says, you know, I had this atheist guy the one time I was, you know, arguing with him and stuff. And he was like, you know, oh, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I come to you now and receive Jesus as my Savior. You know, ha, 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 making fun of me. Did God save him? Hey, he called upon the name of the Lord. He said he believed. But God didn't save a guy like that. Why? He's not coming in a broken and contrite spirit. 
He's not coming and saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. He's not coming with the right attitude. I didn't say the guy has to clean up his whole life first. I didn't say that. A lot of people try to say that about me. I don't teach that. All right? I'm not saying you have to clean up all your life and then you get saved. I'm not saying that. You have to come to God as a sinner. And if you don't come as a sinner, you're not going to get saved. It's as simple as that. And when you do get saved, it's because God purchased you with his blood with his own, excuse me, with his own blood. And if he doesn't purchase you, you're not saved. No matter what you believe or what you say you believe. It's just as simple as that. So if you are saved, you shouldn't have a problem with slavery because you are a slave. You are a bondservant. You are bought. You are owned. Why would you have a problem with slavery then? Matthew chapter 11. Matthew 11 verse 28. Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know what they would put on around the necks of the slaves when they were bringing them out of Africa? A yoke, a collar. Uh, is the Lord's yoke on your life? Is His burden upon you? Do you have a burden for souls? You know? If you do, it came from the Lord. See? It's very important there. And, you know, the real question is there, I mean, if you are a bondservant of Jesus Christ, do you obey when your master gives you a command? I hope so. I'll show you an interesting thing here. How does God picture a sinner at salvation? Go to Job. Show you another way of illustrating this whole point of the thing of a bond servant. Book of Job. Job chapter 11. Job chapter 11 and verse 12. It says here, For vain man would be wise, though man be born like a wild ass's colt. Hmm. I want you to notice two things in that verse. Number one, vain man would be wise. It does not say there that uh, for vain man is wise. It says he would be wise. It's kind of an interesting thing. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7 says, Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You know what the funny thing is about the uh, educated people? The people that go to university after university after university after university? Why are they doing it? If you're wise, you don't need to go for more schooling. So why are you doing it? Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. What is Jesus Christ? John 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus Christ is truth personified. So you have somebody that says, I'm going to go for schooling, I'm going to become wise, and they reject Jesus Christ. They will spend their whole life seeking this mysterious thing called wisdom. They'll try to be wise, and they'll never find it. Interesting. But notice there, the second part in Job 11 verse 12 says, Though man be born like a wild ass's colt. You know, that's also very interesting. Mark chapter 5 verse 4 says, Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. Talking about the man that's possessed with devils. What is a wild ass's colt? 
Well, if you've ever seen a, a rodeo or things like that, they got these guys that come out and they break a horse. And they, you know, the guy's there and he's in the cage thing and, the, and he's, you know, trying to hold on to the thing in there. And they open the door and the horse jumps out of there and he's jumping up and down and the guy's, you know, flailing, trying to ride the horse and all this stuff, trying to break the horse. Wild. Why? Because it's wild. Very interesting. And uh, go to Luke chapter 19. I'll show you here how the Lord... Uh, breaks a wild ass's colt. Luke 